Well, that's a good point maybe to uh, welcome the following institutions to the discussion this evening. Do you want to mm -hmm. say hello? Hello. We've got University of Central Lancash Lancashire, Stirling University, Queen's Belfast, Cardiff University, Lancashire, Canterbury, Northampton and a few USA friends as well. And of course, Lisa McKenzie, who's tuned in too. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, everybody, in particular, Lisa. We're delighted to have you here today. Lisa has tweeted us, if you haven't seen, uh, that she's a little bit uh, fearful of what might be discussed today. <laughs> but let us put your mind at rest that we, we all, I think, enjoyed the book, and particularly for the social work students here, that the messages within that book was uh, extremely valuable. Um, Laura, would you like to introduce the, this evening's guest? That would be great. Yep, we'd like to introduce Professor Ian Ferguson, who's going to talk us through some of the issues that's come out of Lisa McKenzie's book. Hi folks. Uh, first of all, many thanks for inviting me here tonight. I did have to say when I was invited to Glasgow Caledonia University, I did think it was a New York campus. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, Glasgow, Glasgow's, Glasgow's good too. Uh, I don't know about elsewhere, but the cake here has been superlative. Uh, I'm also glad I get the chance to be here because I actually hadn't read Lisa McKenzie's book uh, and I'm very glad I get the chance to do that. I think it's quite an important book. I'm assuming most people have read it so I'm not going to go through and give a yeah. synopsis of the whole book. Uh, what I will try and do is maybe just pick out what I see some of the themes. Uh, this, this is not, by the way, a lecture. It's just my thoughts uh, and some of the issues coming out of Lisa's book. Uh, and we can then open up for discussion because I'm sure some people may agree, disagree and want to comment on, 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 other, on other parts of the book. I mean, just to, just to kick off, uh, reading the book reminded me of uh, a comment. I don't normally quote Conservative Prime Ministers, uh, but I will on this occasion, which is just over 20 years ago, I think about 1993, 94. Uh, some of you may know or may have heard that. Uh, a very young child called James Bulger was scared and horrifically killed uh, by, by two other young children. Uh, and it created what I think we'd probably call a, a moral panic in Britain. In fact, then and now, the number of children who are killed by other children is actually essentially counting on their two hands. But the then Prime Minister, uh, John Major, uh, in a very, very famous quote, uh, said, following the killing, we have to understand a little less and condemn a little more. Uh, and it's a phrase we've heard repeated from time to time. Uh, after the, the riots in England in, in, in the summer of 2011, again, the kind of mood was, we, you know, this is not understanding, this is just bad behaviour. There's no point trying to, to understand this. So I think the first thing that I really want to say about Lisa's book uh, is important is that in direct contrast, I think Lisa's book is about understanding a little more, <coughs> condemning a bit less, or maybe condemning other people. Uh, so I think that's the kind of starting point. I think that really uh, it's an important book in that it takes a fairly uh, despised and demonised section of the community and seeks to make sense of, of what's going on in, in their lives. And obviously, as, as, as you'll know, uh, it's from a very privileged perspective in the sense that, that, that Lisa has grown up in this area of St Anne's. I hadn't actually, I, didn't, I knew nothing about St Anne's except that there's a book that she refers to uh, by Coates and Silburn uh, called Poverty the Forgotten Englishman, which was an incredibly influential book when it came out at the time because the assumption was in the late 60s that poverty had disappeared and everybody was doing well and we're all doing well at the boom. Uh, so that book also I think, focused on St Anne's. Uh, but I think Lisa's book is very helpful in looking at the context of what's happened since and how this area, which is, is, has been fairly demonised in its own way, <coughs> what, what goes on there and what life is about for the people that live there. So I think I really just want to kind of pull three, three main themes uh, out of the book. Uh, I'm not going to use a great deal of sociological jargon tonight, you'll be pleased to hear, <laughs> but there's a term that I think actually describes quite well what's going on here, uh, and it's the term othering, othering, okay? Uh, the dictionary definition of othering is the process of perceiving or portraying someone or something as fundamentally different or alien, okay? 
And I think, I mean, again, that's not a new thing. I mean, if you actually look at the whole basis of the slave trade, uh, it was about seeing black Africans as not really human. I mean, there are all these theological debates on is did black people, did Africans have souls, right? And of course, the common view was no, they didn't. Uh, in South Africa, during the period of apartheid, uh, again, there was lots of good biblical quotations dragged out to show, again, that, that, that the black people were actually, uh, were actually subhuman. Uh, and of course, in Nazi Germany, uh, the term for Jews was untermensch, subhuman. So that process of othering, of, of treating people as fundamentally different from us, okay, uh, is not a new thing. Having said that, I think it's in Britain, and not just Britain, but Western Europe from 2016, it's a very central, dominant part of the culture, uh, particularly in relation to two groups. Uh, one group is Muslims, okay, who are treated as fundamentally the other, uh, so that, uh, I mean, people will probably remember from the, a young white Christian man called Anders Breivik, uh, murdered 70 or 80 young people in Norway a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't remember him demanding that all Christians should apologise for his behaviour. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, from a tiny group, a tiny group uh, of people who call themselves uh, radical Muslims uh, do something outrageous. Muslims globally are called on to condemn their behaviour. It's only in some ways it's reflected their, their, their faith. So that's one group. But the other group is a group that, uh, that, that Lisa writes about, uh, which is... Uh, if you like, the, the poor working class in Britain, particularly, I guess, people who live on council estates. Uh, like Lisa, when I was a kid, uh, I remember moving into a new council house and the great thing about it was uh, it had an inside toilet, which for those of you who have never experienced the joys of an outside toilet in a cold winter night, <laughs> uh, it was a massive step forward. So at that time, these new schemes uh, were, were seen as fantastic, as a great step forward. Uh, I mean, if People have read Billy Connolly's story of moving to Drum Chapel, uh, and everybody thought it was absolutely fabulous. You'd run back in front of the door. As he said, uh, it might look great on the outside. His description was it was, it was a desert with windies. In other words, <laughs> nice houses, but no amenities, no shops, very little. It's an and sounds, sounds kind of similar. Uh, but again, the people who live there now uh, would be among those who, uh, Owen Jones uses the term chavs. Uh, different terms in Scotland, but basically that, that notion of a group of people who have uh, somehow missed the boat in life. I remember one of Thatcher's friends saying that anybody that still travelled with a bus at the age of 30 was a failure. And it's like, I'm not travelling buses all the time, I should say. But, uh, but I think uh, that kind of attitude is, 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 is very common. Again, it's not a new notion. I mean, she talks about George Orwell uh, having, uh, talking about the working class, the working class smell. Right? And so all these kind of stereotypes, again, when I was a kid, I mean, people used to say the working class, they kept their coal in the bath and all this kind of thing. So these kind of stereotypes, but again, I think they have, uh, they've reached a crescendo, I think, in recent years. Uh, partly uh, with the rhetoric following the riots in 2011 by David Cameron talking about the broken society. Uh, there's been the whole Troubled Families Initiative south of the border, which essentially is saying that all the problems that currently exist in Britain due to the behaviour of roughly 10 and 11,000 families. That's the problem. It's not austerity, it's not inequality, it's the behaviour of these individuals. And, uh, and again, the term poverty porn has been mentioned, uh, programmes like Benefit Street uh, are really about portraying uh, some of the poorer sections of working class people as all, I mean, I suppose the word be feckless, lazy, uh, sponging off the state and that, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think the first thing to say about the book is, is, is that we live in a context of that kind of othering, uh, which has become increasingly savage, I have to say. Uh, I mean, I think even as recently as, as two or three years ago, the notion that people would be deliberately deprived of any income whatsoever for one month, two months, three months, in other words, would be left to starve, would have seemed kind of unthinkable to most of us. But that is precisely what benefit sanctions are about, precisely that. Again, three or four years ago, the idea that a million people in, in, in what is still the seventh or eighth richest country in the world would be having to go to food co-op, food banks rather, to get the, the, the food, but it seemed unthinkable. But I think that, 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 that's where we're at. So the first theme that I wanted to talk about from, 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 from Lisa about is othering, but also about the impact of othering, because I think what comes through very clearly through the book is that these... Uh, 
these which are called the representations of people in areas like St Anne's have a massive impact. People, to use the jargon, people internalise uh, negative stereotypes. I'm not going to do a lot of quotes, but she says, it's painful to think that you're not good enough, or to think yourself a failure, no matter what the context. When it is a whole class of people who have been known over generations as failures, not good enough and distasteful, there are severe consequences of being the butt of ingrained class prejudice, inequality and stigmatisation. Uh, what another writer has referred to as the injuries of class. Uh, and it's, and, and it, as we, we know, those of you who have read another uh, very important book that's been in the past few years, The Spirit Level, uh, by Wilkinson and Pickett, uh, these things actually they don't simply affect people's self-esteem, uh, actually, they do much, much more than that. They're, they're, you know, Pope Wilkins and Pickett showed is that if you're if you're in a very unequal society, and Britain is now more unequal than it has ever been, if you're at the bottom of the pecking order, uh, then that affects you in lots of ways. So that, for example, levels of obesity, levels of self-harm, levels of addiction, levels of mental illness, and crucially, I think, levels of violence uh, are much greater at the bottom of society, where people are made to feel inferior. So I think the, the, the first thing I think the book it talks about is about the impact uh, of these representations. And it's very, very, if you think about it for a second, if you are someone who's left school very young, uh, who is in a fairly crap job, uh, or not working at all, then where you've got the prime minister and government ministers and academics and everybody saying that really you're pretty worthless, with this, no matter how strong you are, you're going to take some of that on board, okay? So I think that's the first thing to say, that actually these, I think which Lisa says very clearly in the book, is that people in St Anne's were very aware of these representations, that this is how they were seen by the outside world, and that had an impact on, on how they, they, they saw themselves. But I think the second thing that, that there's a very, very important theme in the book, uh, is the whole concept of resistance. Uh, because on the one hand, people take these representations on board, but they also challenge them. Uh, and they do that in a whole number of, uh, of different ways. I mean, she, she talks about the, the culture of St Anne's, quote, being St Anne's, right? <coughs> uh, and I think it's really, really interesting, because people clearly felt a real pride mm. in being St Anne's. And it's a very, I'm not going to try and deconstruct it all, but clearly quite a kind of complex and rich uh, mix of different things. I think like any culture contains positive and, and negative elements. Uh, one of the positive elements that really I thought was incredible was the, 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 the whole uh, the multiculturalism, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I knew nothing about, but I thought was really, really interesting. <coughs> this is a community of uh, black and white people, and they were always hearing uh, and academics write all the time about the problem of the white working class and how they're feeling excluded and all the rest of it. I thought it was fascinating to read about an area where people, white people wanted to be black, you know, which I, was, I thought was amazing. And basically, that actually, uh, quotes, being white was an insult. If you're seen as too white, you're a bit boring. You know, you like boring food, and you wore boring clothes, and you listen to boring music. Uh, and so people wanted to be black, which I thought was brilliant in that, because actually, the Jamaican community, uh, frankly, their music was better, their food was better, they dressed in much more kind of snazzy ways, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that actually, I mean, I think it, it's really, uh, it seemed to me that the kind of values, particularly the women, particularly the women whom Lisa interviewed of mixed race kids, uh, were incredible. One of the things that came through really strongly uh, was the kind of anti racism of a lot of it. It seems to me that uh, the moral values of these women, uh, certainly in that issue, was considerably higher. Uh, than that of people like David Cameron, who are happy to stigmatise and brand immigrants and encourage racism and so on and so forth. So actually, I thought the whole, I thought there's real strength in that in, in, in that culture. I think just also as in a lot of working class communities, just a real kind of, I mean, not what I use a lot, but there's a resilience. Basically, people supported each other, found ways to survive and so on and and and, and so forth. Uh, but I think the other side of the book, which I also liked, was that uh, there's always a tendency to romanticise the poor, to romanticise working class communities, and I don't think the book does that. Yeah. So I think what comes through is very clearly is that there's a lot of it living in, while people wanted to stay in St Anne's and, and, and strongly identified with it, uh, but at the same time there was a lot that they didn't like, right? I mean, whether it was the, the drug culture, 
the violence and so on and so forth. Uh, there was a lot that people uh, found, found, uh, found damaging. Uh, but I think also, again, we have to put that in context. I mean, there's, there's that individual resistance which was reflected in people's style of dress, what they wore and so on and so forth. Uh, it's clear that, from the interviews, a lot of people didn't see themselves as particularly political. But I think that, you know, clearly, when we got on to the discussion of the riots uh, in August 2011, uh, I think it's very interesting. Because I said at the outset, the way that these uh, riots were perceived uh, almost unanimously in the House of Commons and elsewhere, was these were just, they were frankly just bad people. They were bad people. That, that, that was really the kind of level of it, and bad people might, must be punished. And the outcome of that uh, was the kind of sentences, I think the word they use is exemplary sentences. So people, someone for example had stolen a bottle of water, I think at five years, uh, people get much longer sentences. People were punished brutally uh, as a result of it because they were, 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 bad, were seen as bad people. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, I mean, just to, to read one, one young guy who was uh, involved in the riots, uh, and Lisa asked him what the riots been about, and he said it's about money. Nothing else matters. If you get money, no one cares who you are. He looked up to his dad who was on, on the road to his drug dealing. This 14-year-old in St Anne's knew and recognised the respected status that came with this local position. He wanted to be respected, he wanted to feel valued and knew his position outside the state unless he had money was of no value. I thought this was fascinating. I asked Jerome what he wanted to be when he left school. His answer was simple, entrepreneur. I want to be rich like Alan Sugar. Mm. So it's kind of ironic because basically what we're seeing is that in many ways some of these young people these have completely taken on the values of neoliberalism. Mm. Right? Completely taken them on. But because the avenues are blocked, the normal avenues are blocked, therefore they try and get it in other ways. Right? So that was what the rights were about for some. I think for others, uh, it was more just simply about about rage. Uh, and I think, again, Lisa, I think, uh, I've not got a quote in front of me, but basically, again, uh, what she's saying, that we really can't understand these rights simply by looking at what happened in that day or the next day or whatever. That we actually have to look at the whole history of, of that estate and the anger that builds up and the frustration and the bitterness. Uh, it reminded me of just one more book I'll mention, which again is really worth a read if you haven't mentioned. A book called Dark Heart, which came out in 19... written by a guy called Nick Davis, who's a Guardian journalist. Uh, and basically he's saying exactly the same things. It also followed similar riots that took place in the 1990s in the Manchester area. And really what he's saying is that what this was about, it was young men who felt they had nothing in their lives, so they rioted, they stole, etc. And it was an expression of rage. Uh, and just reading about the riots, uh, it reminded me of, there's a quote from Martin Luther King. I think it's interesting, and this might be a cause of some debate. Uh, Lisa doesn't condemn the rioters. Maybe people feel she should. She doesn't condemn the rioters in any way. Uh, and it reminded me of a quote by Martin Luther King uh, in 1968, uh, just a few weeks before his death, uh, and following a whole series of riots uh, across American cities. Uh, again, mainly in, in, in the kind of inner black ghettos. And Martin Luther King said, uh, it's not enough for me to stand before you tonight and condemn riots. It would be morally irresponsible for me to do that without at the same time condemning the contingent intolerable conditions that exist in our society. These conditions are the things that cause individuals to feel that they have no alternative than to engage in violent rebellions to get attention. And I must say tonight that a riot is the language of the unheard. It's the language of the unheard. And I think that comes through quite strongly through the book, that basically for a lot of the young kids who were involved in these riots, it was like before then they were seen as nothing. It was a chance for them to, uh, to gain respect, which is, I mean, not necessarily in political and most effective way of doing it, but it was, if you like, a, a, an outcry on their part. So finally, I just, I just have no idea how long I've been speaking for, but I'm going to wind up anyway. But, uh, but I mean, I think just the third thing, which Lisa touches on, but uh, I'll just say a little bit more about, uh, is that, you know, what is all this demonisation about? What is all this othering about? Who, who benefits? Who benefits from, from treating people in this kind of way? Uh, and I think there's really two main reasons. If we look at what's going on just now, uh, and again, one of the points she makes is how much worse uh, 
things have got in St Anne's over the past five or ten years in terms of closure of libraries, closure of pubs, etc. etc. <coughs> First is financial, I think. As, as she rightly says, what we are seeing, what austerity means, uh, is, is that actually a lot of the kind of uh, services that people have taken for granted, really in the post war welfare state, that people have seen as rights. Are, are now going. I mean, David Cameron talks about we have to end the culture of entitlement, right? And a lot of people's belief that they have a right to decent health care, they have a right to decent housing, they have a right to the job. So that's what that's about. Uh, and it's also, I think, about making the poor, the poor pay uh, for a crisis that they didn't create. And we're now into year, is it year nine of a crisis that began in 2007, a global financial crisis. Uh, if you've been reading the financial press over the past couple of days, you'll know that the, the expectation is that probably for the next 12 months we will plunge back into a second financial crisis. And for me, austerity, whether it's in Greece or in Glasgow or St Anne's, is primarily about making the poor pay for a crisis that didn't, didn't care, particularly disabled people, people in benefits and so on. So that, that's the first aspect. But I think there's, a, there's another aspect that is less touched on, uh, which is about essentially divide and rule. It's, I think that this othering is about driving a wedge. Uh, and I think it's George George for the phrase between quotes, the strivers and the shirkers, right? Uh, driving a wedge between often low-paid workers and those who, for whatever reason, are not, are not, are not working. So essentially, I think it's a, a, kind of a, a, a divide and rule policy. Uh, and I think, therefore, to me, a lot of the attacks on the poor, whether it's Benefit Street, whether it's cuts and benefits, whether it's sanctioning or whatever, it's really about sending out a message to those who are in work, right? That if you don't go along with this, and if you don't accept lower wages and so on or whatever, you could end up in this situation. I'll just end in this. There's a there's a story that in Liverpool, I don't know Liverpool that well, but apparently those of you who know Liverpool will know Liverpool's pretty flat, right? There's not that many hills. But there's one hill apparently in Liverpool. <laughs> and on this hill, uh, that was where they built the workhouse in the nineteenth century. They built the workhouse on the hill. <clears throat> and there was a very clear reason for doing that. It was so that wherever you were in Liverpool, you would know that if you stepped out of line, right, if you became unemployed, if you became poor, that's where you could end up. Okay? So I think a lot of the other thing that's going on just now is about sending out a message to the rest of us mm -hmm. that if you challenge, if you fight for better conditions as students, if you, if you challenge racism, mm -hmm. if you challenge benefits, mm -hmm. That's where you can end up, right? You don't want to fall into this group. You might have nothing, but you're not as bad as them, right? It's a bit divide and rule. And I think, actually, as a consequence of that, we all suffer. And I think that's why it's very important. When we read about the people of St Anne's, we're not talking about the others. We're talking about people very like ourselves. And I think that's why Lisa's book, I think, in terms of helping to deepen that understanding, I think it is enormously valuable. So we'll leave it there. Um, we're just going to take some questions from the floor just now, um, but if you can still continue to tweet in questions from hashtag SWBK. Thanks. Has anyone got any questions just now? Um, as students, we hear a lot about the decline and now absence of community-based social work. Mm -hmm. In your experience, what do you think is successful and effective about this form of social work? And how would this apply to areas like St Anne's? Good question. Uh, I, I think what we've seen in recent years is often a withdrawal of services from poor areas. I mean, actually, Lisa talks about it in the book where yeah. she says that increasingly uh, there are less and less social workers or community workers or whatever, and increasingly what people see is the sharp end of the state, i.e. the police, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, now, I think that in the parallel process within social work, is in a whole number of areas. Social work offices are now very, very large, usually huge open plan offices, often located very far away from the areas that they're supposed to serve. Uh, same is true of hospitals and other facilities, as we know in Glasgow. <coughs> and, and, and so people are increasingly removed from that, right? Now, I think that the reality of that, and when, when I qualify in social work, I'm not get into nostalgia here, lots of problems then. Uh, but the reality was you would, you would normally be doing home visits and or, for example, uh, you would have community flats. So you had social work services that were accessible for people, right? That meant that uh, social workers 
had a much greater understanding, I think, of the reality of the lives of, of, of the people we were working with. Partly because you were based in the area, you were visiting in their own homes, you were spending time with them, you were often involved in community groups. And again, that's one of the losses, particularly in terms of social work, right? Is that there's a very rich tradition in social work, not just of individual casework, but of community work, right? So we've gone from that situation where, uh, as those of you who know Sue White's research on children and family social work, particularly in England, but I think also to a large extent up here, social workers will now, children and family social workers, will often spend 60, 70, 80% of their day sitting in front of computers. Okay, filling in, a, you know, doing assessments or whatever. Uh, there is much, one of the main complaints that social workers uh, come to in the Social Work Action Network is that there is much less opportunity now for relationship-based work, let alone community work. So I think that's a huge loss. Uh, I also think, again, we hear a lot about evidence-based practice. Uh, it seems to me that the strongest body, one of the strongest bodies of evidence is that what helps make people make a difference in their lives is the quality of the relationship they have with their workers. Uh, and so the fact that there's so little time being allowed for that, also because of huge caseloads. Yeah? Uh, so I think all of these things reduce the effectiveness of social work. Uh, but more positively, I think it's also why I think there's quite a strong <clears throat> drive just now to get back to community social work. In my experience, that's how most people want to work. There are some very good projects in Glasgow, uh, people, you know, the Children and Families Roma project in Govan Hill, which effectively I think is doing social, uh, community social work, is one good example. There are examples around, we need a lot more of them. Not, not, both because I think it's, it's for, for people who live in the areas, it's preferable. I also think it's much more effective. Thank you. Um, can we have another question? I just wanted to ask <coughs> about integration, really. Because Lisa mentioned that um, unfortunately it is now in severe decline and the new multi-service centre does not belong to the local community but to the people that work in there. And, and you know, I'm Eastern European, so I could like, I had my share. So I just wanted to ask, well, how would you define the integration when actually the other side would be happy with people from some towns? Then would they be accepted? How would you measure it? Do you mean integration of minorities? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. when you know they, they put the new medical centres there and everything, but basically this joined the whole community by that. Um, so when would they be happy? With yeah. the people there? And I think I think it's quite interesting to look at the experience of Glasgow. Uh, just two two <laughs> types of experience. The first, when the first uh, when the first asylum seekers began to to come to Glasgow in the early two thousands. Uh, and they were located, in, uh, as always, were located in some of the poorest areas of the city, in the north of Glasgow and Sight Hill. And initially there was quite a lot of friction, quite a lot of tension between the, the new communities and the people who lived there, uh, because the people who lived there perceived the asylum seekers as benefits that they weren't getting, right? So there's quite a lot of tension. Uh, it took, I think, quite a lot of work uh, by community workers, by, by anti-racist activists and so on, uh, and actually, in the process, it was the death of the, the racist killing of a young man in the area. Uh, but I think a high point was from the demonstration, I think in 2001, 2002, uh, from Sight Hill in Glasgow, uh, under the banner Sight Hill United Against Poverty and Racism. Okay? Uh, and I think that we're, we're seeing something similar now in the south side of the city, in areas such as Govan Hill where there has been quite a considerable increase in the Roma population in my area. Uh, I think essentially, and I know that both community organisations and social workers down there are emphasising this, that we have to campaign for and work for better conditions for all the people who live in that community. You know, quite clearly, if people, if, you know, if, you're, if, if a lot of new refugees are coming into an already strained community, it's going to create more strains. The way to deal with it, I think, is actually it's important that light improves for, for everyone. I, mean, I think the, there's a whole, in Glasgow, I suppose, most other big cities, this city is built on immigration, right? From the Highlands, from, in the Highlands of the 19th century, the Jews in the early 20th century, Irish, and then in the 50s and 60s, from, from India and, and, and Bangladesh and so on. And it's you know, clearly massively enriched the city. Uh, but I do think that, particularly in a period of austerity, 
right? When people are seeing their services cut the benefits cut and so on. It's possible in that situation for the pretensions to flare up. I just, but I think actually it's, there's a kind of battle of ideas goes on. Uh, I was I mentioned this at a meeting here earlier today, but one of the, a statistic that I thought was incredible. <clears throat> We've seen recently uh, the whole issue about asylum seekers and refugees from uh, from the Middle East. Uh, and particularly following, and, and I think, you know, again, politicians have been cranking up, frankly, cranking up the racism. Uh, following the death of Ellen Kurdi, the, the three-year-old uh, on the beach, I think in many ways shifted that mood. Now, it goes back and forward, but there was a, a report, a research report came out two or three weeks ago showing that something like a third of all people in the UK, in the past six months, a third of all adults in the UK have in some way expressed support for refugees either by signing a petition, by donating money, in some cases by going to Cali or whatever, right? So I think there's a battle of ideas going on. Uh, I think the conditions we're living in, as we know from history, right, where the system is in crisis, it's easy to look for scapegoats. Uh, I think what it does mean we have to campaign for, 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 for better facilities for everyone. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? You know, it's just that... Um... Uh, so on the point about um, community development, because we're having a bit of a Twitter discussion about it just now, uh -huh. and um, there's a kind of parallel for me between the community development you're talking about and the ethnography that Lisa used <coughs> to do the work that she did. And yeah. it's, it, you could stretch that too far, I understand that. But I suppose for a lot of students, social work students, um, currently they'll never have experienced community development. And I probably I think it would be helpful for you to give some kind of tangible example of what that looks like. And you refer to the remote rural community in Glasgow. So so what's been done there that you know <clears throat> I'm not saying is ideal or you know um, isn't to some extent top down because that's part of the discussion that we're having. You know how can social work not be top down? But um, what, what, why is why is that different to what's happening in ordinary social work, if you like, or kind of um, social work elsewhere? Yeah, I mean it's it, it's a good it's a very good point, and I do think that social work students should insist that they have community development teaching within the courses. Uh, again, I'm getting my age away, but I think when when I did my social work training in the early eighties at Stirling, we had a whole module a whole module on community development as well as a whole module on welfare rights <clears throat> because it was seen as an integral part of social work. And there's a long tradition of community development social, not, not least in this region. At one point, but in, in, in the late 70s, early 80s, throughout the Clyde region, there were something like 250, 300 people employed by the social work department as community workers. So that gives you a flavour of it. In terms of what it means, I mean, I think two points I would make about, uh, about Pugh's point. One is uh, the link to research and the link to, to, to Lisa's research, because again, it seems to me that a uh, a method of intervention, if you like, is action research, uh, which is something I hope you do cover in your course. And I heard actually just at a seminar last week down in Govan Hill, uh, one of the examples they gave of that was that the uh, social workers within the Children and Families Roma team had done a check on uh, how many people within the local primary school uh, were receiving free school meals. And what they found was that the numbers of kids in, in Glasgow as a whole, I can't remember the exact figure, uh, something like 35, 40 percent, something like that, maybe even higher across Glasgow as a whole. In the local primary schools in Govan Hill, <coughs> there was about 20 percent. Okay, people were not aware of this and did not know their kids were eligible. <coughs> so the local team ran a campaign and worked with the teachers mm -hmm. to raise the level of kids getting free school meals. As a result of which, it's gone up by about 15 to 20 percent. Right now, by working in that kind of way, which is not working at an individual level, working like in a collective level, gathering the research, doing the research, right? Uh, they have uh, they reckon they brought some it's an incredible figure, but tens of thousands of extra income into mm -hmm. the area, right? Uh, and basically, it meant that another 70, 80, 90 kids were now receiving free school meals. So again, in terms of levels of health within the area. Right? So there's a general point there. I mean, the same point is true about medicine. Most of the great advances in medicine over the past 100 years, 150 years, have not been due to uh, you know, some you know, 
biological discoveries, whatever, that have been through the introduction of clean water, better sewage, all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole thing about looking at the community as a whole in that way. More uh, specifically in terms of community development, uh, and this is in terms of my own professional experience, also very much in my experience, it is actually about rather than individualising problems, and I'm sure you're very familiar with See, right, Mill's notion of public issues, private troubles, right? A lot of the time, social workers only work at the level of private troubles, right? But the reality is that most of the problems, or many of the problems that people face, right, are collective problems, okay? Uh, so, in, in Govan Hill, uh, some of the problems have been about the isolation of the Roma women in the community. So, one of the things they've actually done is just created a space for the Roma women to come together, now it was something like sewing or cooking or whatever, right? But just to bring them together to make them less isolated. Uh, some of my own work uh, during the 80s, I worked in, in Pollock uh, and working with lone parent groups there. Again, often very isolated, but one of the things we said was a sitter service, right? Which actually meant the women could get a break from their children. So I think it's about, I think community development means thinking collectively and actually recognising a lot of the problems that your individual clients face are actually collective problems. Just, I'll just mention one more, which I think is a huge challenge for social work, and nobody's doing any of it yet, is that there's now been several reports that have come out in the past year showing that one of the biggest problems currently in society, particularly among older, older people, is social isolation. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think the answer to socialisation social isolation is for an individual social worker to, to, to visit every old person. But there's a rich tradition in social work of social networking, right, of ways of bringing people together collectively, etc., etc. So it does seem to me that we need to get, we need to rediscover and reconnect with some of these traditions. <laughs> Um, the, book, um, the book suggests that being from St Anne's uh, discourages individuals in pursuing work in other areas of Nottingham due to that feeling of exclusion and stigmatisation. Um, would you say that this is a fair conclusion and do you think that this is a limitation for other individuals with similar experiences across Britain? I think it's, I mean, one of the things that I found interesting about I found myself wondering to what extent uh, there is a real sense of St Anne's almost being cut off from the rest of Nottingham. Uh, and I found myself wondering, I don't have the answer, so other people might have the answer, to what extent that's true of, say, a city like Glasgow. Uh, do people in Castlemill or Drumchapel or, or, or inner city areas like Gorbals feel that same sense of being cut off? I'm not sure that they do, but maybe I'm wrong in that. Uh, I think certainly, obviously, what is true I think that, I mean, and it may also be, I have to say, there's perhaps a slightly different culture, in, political culture in Scotland, right? Uh, I think it's certainly true south of the border uh, that there's a real, this, I mean, I, I actually hate the phrase social housing, you know, because it's now identified as a sign of failure, right? Uh, whereas, I mean, seriously, when I was a kid, actually, most people lived in council houses. That's where most people lived. And the reality now is, I mean, it's also used to mask a housing crisis because the reality is now for most people, I'm sure for a lot of you guys here, it will be very hard to buy a house, right? But the alternative is pretty, often pretty awful private rented accommodation. So there's a bigger discussion there. I think certainly what is true is that uh, people who live in, 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 in schemes, as we call them in Scotland, uh, may often feel a sense of inferiority or whatever. The only qualification of putting that is I think that without being party political, uh, I think the movement here, the, the referendum around independence, actually challenged quite a lot of these uh, issues. I remember I was actually, I'll put my cards on the table, was involved in, 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 in campaigning around that and, and going to, both going to some of the most outlying areas, you actually, in some of the demonstrations in George Square in the week before the referendum, it was some of the poorest people in Glasgow who were there. And I think it was a real sense of people, and, and for, for viewers south of the border, the issue was not primarily, I think, about independence. Very, you know, it was more a strong anti-austerity. People wanted a different kind of society. And I actually found it very moving that a lot, you go to some of the schemes and people are actually saying, you think things could be different. So there was a sense of people kind of daring to hope. Uh, so I think that that mood of feeling inferior or oppressed can actually change, uh, but it depends, I think, on wider social movements rather than just what happens in the scheme.
Um, thank you very much. We're just going to pass over to Dave now. He's been keeping an eye on Twitter. So he'll um, just kind of ask you some questions from there. Hot talking. Questions for Ian from at Social Work Book Group. Um, are these spaces that we're talking about, are, do you believe that these spaces are designed to cut people off? Yes, I think that uh, possibly, I think, to a greater extent, so far, this could change, but so far south of the border, uh, I think in the past 15, 20 years, uh, we have seen uh, all, almost a cordoning of, of, of some big uh, working class estates, particularly black working class estates south of the border, a place like Totten, so following the riots there. A very, very heavy policing presence. And one of, one of the other factors that Lisa talks about for young people getting involved in the riots was quotes to get the police. Okay, she talks about that. Mm -hmm. And I think the level of hatred of the police, particularly as we know, I mean, actually, I was going to say the high level of stop and search uh, in a lot of these schemes. It's interesting, actually, according to recent reports, it's even higher in, in, in schemes in Scotland. Uh, but it's certainly very high, so I think among a layer of young working class people, both black and white, uh, there's a real hatred of the police. And I think I sent in some of these estates that they are, that they are effectively cordoned off. Okay, super. Well, we're going to bring this to a close now. Again, just to thank uh, everyone that's joined us online, the University of Central Lancashire, Stirling, Queen's Belfast, Cardiff, Lancashire, Canterbury, Northampton, we've had Sussex and Stirling. And a whole host of other people, a few people from USA as well, um, and Lisa McKenzie were delighted to join us. And I suppose that just leaves us to break off into our individual discussions groups, and we'll uh, cease the broadcast, but rightly finishing by thanking Ian very much for his time. Hashtag SWB. There we go. <laughs> <laughs>